Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, um, we just ask Holy Spirit that you would come and teach us, open up um, the Word, Lord, and reveal to us the Word made flesh, the Lord Jesus, and the principles that he wants us to live by. Lord, uh, we want to just see from the Scriptures things that we can discover and apply to our own lives as we seek to learn your ways and to learn about you and to know you. So, Lord, um, speak to us. Help me, Lord, to, um, uh, to not make the details boring, Lord, or uh, be too concise, but, Lord, to dig for the meat and the hidden treasure in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 2 Kings chapter 9, and to begin 2 Kings chapter 9, we've got to back up to a prophecy. So hold your finger there and go back to 1 Kings chapter 19. And this is the Lord speaking directly to Elijah. He's in the cave. Uh, the voice of the Lord speaks to him. And um, verse 15, he says to Elijah, Go your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you come, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Everybody see that? It's the first definitive word. So it's odd that the Lord would give a prophet of Israel a prophetic word concerning the king over Syria, but he does. And then verse 16, And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, um, of Ebomolah, shall you anoint to be prophet in your, your place, your successor. And so of these, the only one that Elijah personally ever does is anoint Elisha. And yet the word of the Lord to Elijah was, you're going to do this. And so my, my contention is, through his discipling, his spiritual son, Elisha, one of these things was done. The, um, uh, the king of uh, Hazael, king over Syria, is anointed by Elisha. I'll show you in a moment. And then another guy is going to anoint Jehu sent by Elisha. So Elisha doesn't even do this directly. Now, what's my point? My point is, the word of the Lord to Elijah was, I want you to go and do this. And the Lord was um, putting that anointing, that charge in Elijah, who was apparently able to delegate it and it still be considered fulfillment of prophecy with him doing it. You follow that? And so there's a, there's a continuing thread through scriptures, and it's, uh, it's a little disturbing, but it's also a little bit comforting. And it's essentially that a, this, a prophetic word given to you by God can be fulfilled by your descendants, and it's as if you did it. It appears over and over again in the scriptures, if you have eyes to see it and ears to hear what I'm saying. So in the mind of God, that lineage, both the spiritual sons and daughters and the natural sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters, if they fulfilled the word of the, God, of the Lord spoken to you, it's you that received the word of the Lord and you're fulfilling it somehow in a, a way that only heaven knows. We'll see it when we get there. You know, which makes me wonder about you and your house shall be saved. How, long, how far can we take that? Well, I, I pray for everybody that's related to me in all kind of ways. I'm going for the max. And so back over to this prophecy. So he said, I want you to anoint uh, Hazael to be the king over Syria. And then I want you to anoint Jehu to be the king over Israel. So go back to 2 Kings. And I said we're starting in chapter 9. But actually in chapter 8, in verse 7, Elisha came to uh, Damascus and Ben Hadad uh, was sick. And the king said to Hazael, his servant, you go to Elisha. And so Elisha interacts with Hazael and says, you're to be the king over Syria. This is where this word is fulfilled, is in 2 Kings chapter 8. And now the, the next one, um, Jehu, is going to be um, made king in chapter 9. So chapter 9, verse 1. Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets, called him as a messenger, one of his spiritual sons. He said, gird up your loins, take this box of oil in your hand, go to Ramoth Gilead. Look out there and find uh, Jehu. Verse 3, take the box of oil, pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and don't, don't hang around. So how, I'm asking the question, how to the Lord was not only Elijah didn't do it, 
Elisha didn't do it, but Elisha sent a guy to do it. But the word of the Lord was to Elijah, you're going to do it. You see it? And so the Lord can't lie. The scriptures are not making a mistake here. The Lord is trying to convey something to us, you know. In verse 6, uh, he arose, went into the house, he poured the oil on um, Jehu's head, said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I've anointed you king over the, of the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And you shall smite the house of Ahab. This is a prophetic word he's giving now. That I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. Now this Jehu is getting a serious spiritual impartation. Because he's going to accomplish exactly what was prophesied. And um, verse 10, And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Now that prophecy about Jezebel had been given previously by Elijah. That same word Elijah gave to Ahab. The dogs are going to lick up your blood and they're going to eat Jezebel. Remember? And so he's, he's echoing that prophecy, but it's the word of the Lord nonetheless. And so he's there, Jehu's there with his friends, and he comes out, and they said, what does this guy want? They said, oh, he's crazy. He just um, anointed me king over Israel. And verse 13, they, they bought it. They said they, they hastened, took every man his garment, put it on under him on top of the uh, stairs, blew the trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. And so Jehu had a little following immediately from this group of men, and uh, he immediately goes and pursues the king of Israel, who is the son of Ahab. In verse 24, Jehu, I mean, still in chapter 9, Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram, Jehoram between his arms. The arrow went in his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. So he kills the king of Israel. Then he goes immediately after the king of Judah, who is also um, a relative of Ahab. Um, the, uh, Ahaziah is... The, the son of Athaliah, Ahab's sister. It's confusing, but they're related. Verse 27, so when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him, and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is um, by Ebleam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. So in just quick succession, he kills both the king of the north and the king of the south in fulfillment of prophecy, both of them related to Ahab, you're going to destroy the whole house of Ahab. And so he's in the hunt now. Then he goes after Jezebel. Verse 30, when Jehu was coming to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and uh, teared her head. She did the beehive hairdo thing. <laughs> or maybe it was dreadlocks. I don't know what she did, but she, she fixed her hair and looked out the window. Now, how old you reckon this woman was? This old hussy. <laughs> you know, in my, did anybody ever see the old Gunsmoke show? Yeah. Miss Kitty looked pretty good in the early versions, but as it got, went on by, Miss Kitty wasn't so looking so good. This is like the old Miss Kitty. <laughs> she looked good when she was young. And Jehu entered in at the gate and said, um, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? And then he said to the, the eunuchs that were upstairs with Jezebel, throw her down. Verse 33, so they threw her out of the window. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And uh, he trampled her underfoot with his chariot. And verse 35, they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than her skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore, they came again and told him, he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the, the Tishbite, saying, in the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dogs of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. And so this is a horrible fulfillment. I don't know why not the hand, the palms, and the feet, except they're a little tough. You know, you reckon that's why the dogs didn't want to eat the palms? I don't know. Anyway, they, the dogs didn't. Mosquitoes won't bite you on the palms, on the, on the balls of your feet. They'll bite you on the tops, but they won't bite you on the palms or on the bottoms. A quick story. I was in uh, Sierra Leone one night, and uh, this is, I don't know what made me think of this. I guess the, the biting on the palms. About 2 o'clock in the morning, we were going home that, that day. It's 2 o'clock a.m. We'd had a couple of weeks of good meetings. 
And all of a sudden, dogs literally surrounded, we're on the end of the building, surrounded the end of the building on three sides, going crazy. And at the same time, we started getting nailed by mosquitoes and the power went out. And so we go in the kitchen, it was me and this pastor buddy of mine, Don Shackelford, who is, um, lives in Ohio. And we were getting bit by mosquitoes on the palms of our hands. I said, are you getting bit on the palms? He goes, yeah. And we got flashlights. We couldn't see what was biting us. It was demonic. The dogs were going crazy. All the, We looked out the window. The dogs were facing the building, barking on three sides. And these invisible bugs were biting us that weren't there. And it was so ridiculous, rather than um, coming against the darkness, we started laughing because it was so blatantly demonic and supernatural. We started laughing. And the more we laughed and cut up about it, eventually the dogs shut up. And the things stopped biting us. It was like the devil couldn't stand being ridiculed, I guess. I don't know what it was. But one other thing, Siddiqui was staying in the apartment next door. He came running over. He had had a dream that some um, criminal had climbed up the back of the building, was coming in to kill me and Don. So he's in a whole other apartment. He didn't get bit by the bugs, but he heard the dogs and came over and thought somebody had broke his crazy. So chapter 10, Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And uh, Jehu went after all these guys and um, uh, proceeded to take care of them. In verse 18, he also went after the, the priests of Baal, Baal. He gathered all the people together and he said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. And so he set up this big festival to bring all the priests of Baal and um, all the worshipers. And they brought them all together in verse 25. It came to pass as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and the captains, Go in and slay them. Let none, none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword. And the guard and the captains cast them out and went into the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And so verse 28, Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. However, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, uh, Jehu departed not after them, to wit the golden calves that were at Bethel and in Dan. So this Jehu was as close as the northern kingdom ever had to a really godly king. And yet he still didn't do away with the golden calf worship, nor the alternative uh, holy cities of Bethel and Dan that were in opposition to Jerusalem. And so the, the Lord's ultimate... Um, Estimation of Jehu was not a good guy, you know, because there's too much compromise. Hello. Verse 31, but Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord his God uh, with all of his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. And verse 35, Jehu slept with his fathers. They buried him in Samaria, and Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, chapter 11 is, it's interesting really as an insertion. I'm not going to, let me just talk about it. This, um, one of the guys that Jehu killed, Ahaziah, was the king of the south, okay? His mother was a lady named Athaliah, who was Ahab's sister. Another very wicked woman, worshipped the same gods as Jezebel and all this stuff. So when this Ahaziah was killed and all the other descendants of Ahab were killed, this lady steps up and takes the throne of Judah, not Israel, not the north. She takes the throne of the south. And so what she decides to do is she's going to kill every descendant of King David. This is like a major de demonic attempt to break the, the word of the Lord. You know, David will never um, lack having a king, a descendant to reign on the throne. So this Athaliah decides she's going to kill every Davidic, Davidic descendant. And she does kill all but one. There's one um, guy named Joash who is hidden um, by a priest. And so Joash was hidden, and then six years this Athaliah is reigning. And then the priest who's hiding this young kid brings him out and begins to rally the people around. In verse 13, when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and the people... She came to the people in the temple court of the Lord, and when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar, note that pillar just mentally, I'll come back to it, as was the manner of the princes and the trumpeters of the king. 
And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets, and Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said to them, Have her brought forth and um, kill her. So that's what they did. And all the people rejoiced that this Athaliah was dead because she was, she was very wicked and this young Joash began to reign. Now that pillar, that pillar appears twice in the scriptures we're in tonight. And some believe that this pillar is Jacob's pillow. It's a, I, I, I don't know how many of you were here when I told that story about the stone of scone and uh, Bethel and Jacob's ladder and that dream and all that. But there is a fair number of people, I'm not one of them, that believe that this Jacob's pillow appears in numerous places in the scriptures. And so this pillar is one of the places they say this was Jacob's pillow because the pillar is associated with kings being installed at various times in the, in the Old Testament. And Jacob's pillow is used, or what they believe it to be, is used for the installation of the monarchy in Europe. It's called the Stone of Scone. Right now it's in Scotland. But it was in Westminster Abbey for over 1,100 years. And so there's this long trail with the thing. But this thing is how the European monarchy claimed their descent from King David. They claimed that Zedekiah had two daughters that went with Jeremiah down to Egypt and then over to Scotland with this Jacob's pillow. It's a long story. But it shows up again tonight in another section. Chapter 12, in the seventh year of Jehu, um, Joash began to reign. Um, he reigned in Jerusalem. Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And so this young Joash did what was right as long as this priest lived. There's more details about him in Chronicles. We'll get into it. But ultimately, he, he stumbled after the priest died. And um, uh, he ends up not having a very great um, um, epitaph on him. But notice in verse 18, Joash, king of Judah, took all the hallowed things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his fathers, kings of Judah, had dedicated and his own hallowed things and all the gold that was found in the treasures of the house of the Lord. That's the temple. All the gold that was found in the temple and in the king's house. And he sent it to the king of Syria. He paid tribute. Now this is one of, remember several weeks ago I told you that there are like numerous times the temple was plundered by assorted people. And it's hard to, one of the reasons they have a hard time telling where the, the Ark of the Covenant and all these things are was because it didn't just happen once. It happened many times. Jerusalem was breached many times. And then other times the treasures were given as a, an attempt to appease invaders. This is one of them. And uh, the, what's the moral of that story? When you got Lord, the Lord on your side, you don't have to appease your enemies by giving away all your stuff. But this guy did it, and it actually brought a measure of judgment on him. And so um, uh, he does, and Amaziah... His son reigns in his stead. Hence, the, remember I said these names get really close. Azariah, Amaziah, Ahaziah. We got, we got hot and cold running Zias. Chapter 13. Chapter 13, for me, contains one of the most interesting um, keys concerning prophetic ministry um, that's in the Bible. First, we have this succession of kings and um, these things take place. Different ones die. And verse, let's just start in verse 14 of chapter 13. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness wherever he died. Now, I just want to pause there for a second and note, there's no indication Elisha was ever in sin. There's no indication Elisha was ever out of the will of God. And yet, some kind of sickness claimed his life. This is the same Elisha who had been used to bring a dead boy back to life multiple miracles. What am I saying? That not every sickness is a result of some sin issue or some lack of faith. You know, sometimes you hear that, you know, obviously if they had had more faith, they could have gotten well. Well, there was nothing wrong with this guy's faith. Agreed? And the Bible said he was sick of the sickness that he was going to die from. And so it's a done deal. He's going to die from it, but there's no indication there's a problem with Elisha. In fact, after he dies, his bones are still so anointed, a guy gets raised from the dead with his bones. So he's not under any kind of broken relationship with the Lord. So Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept. 
and um, said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Interesting terminology in view of the fiery chariots that took his master away. By the way, he's probably been ministering some 50 years since Elijah went and first got him. Uh, he's an old man now. He had a very long prophetic ministry through many kings. In, chapter in verse 15, Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. And he took the bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. He put his hand on it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. He said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you shall smite the Syrians in Aphek until you have utterly consumed them, destroyed them. Let's pause a second. Syria. This is 3,000 years ago. Not quite. 2,700 years, 2,800 years ago. Is Syria still a problem today? I'm not talking to you, Siri. I said Syria, not Siri. <laughs> Don't you be listening to me. <laughs> Talk about devils. There's devils in this thing, I'm telling you. <laughs> Peter, you got to cast that thing out of there. So, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived told the king of Judah, shoot that arrow out the window, strike these arrows on the ground, you're going to utterly destroy the Syrians. Right? Isn't that what we just read? Let's read a little further. And so, verse 18, take the arrow, he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, smite him on the ground, he smote him three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have smitten him four or five or six times. Now, did you hear anything about five or six times? He just said, strike him on the ground. He said, you, if you had, you would have smitten Syria until you had destroyed it. But now you're only going to defeat Syria three times. This was a conditional word without the conditions given. Do you understand what I just said? It was a, he, there was a condition to this word coming. You're going to utterly destroy Syria as a people group forever. But there's a condition and it's unspoken. And it had to do, I believe, with the attitude of the man's heart, the king of Judah. There was something in his reception of that prophetic word that disqualified him from receiving the full benefit of it. Because Elisha was angry with him, with the way he responded he said, you know, because he only struck the ground three times. It was almost like it was a half-hearted, I'll do what you say, but, you know, I'm not really totally invested in this. And then Elisha rebuked him. But whatever the case, this was a conditional prophecy from God that the condition was not spoken. Would you agree on that part? Because the condition came up after the film. Let me give you another example. There's, there's a bunch of them. I've identified like six through the scriptures, various places. I'll give you another one. Jonah is sent to Nineveh. In a few minutes, we're going to come to the Assyrians. Nineveh is the headquarters of Assyria. He's given a one-sentence prophecy. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Next day. In 39 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Next day. In 38 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Period. Get to the end of the 40 days, Nineveh repents in sackcloth and ashes. And the Lord says, I'm not going to destroy him. Jonah got furious. He said, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. But it was not, he didn't tell them unless you repent. There's nothing in the scriptures that indicate unless you turn and repent. It was flat out, God's going to destroy you. So there was a conditional, the difference being their response from their heart was positive toward the will of the Lord. And so they got a positive outcome with this. He reversed it. And I'll give you another one. There's another one in this section if I don't get to it tonight. Isaiah the prophet, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, goes into Hezekiah. He says, get your house in order. You're going to die. He walks out. This is Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet tells you you're going to die. Sister, you better pack your bags because you're out of here. Right? He doesn't even get out of the building. Hezekiah turns toward the wall and says, Lord, please give me some more time. The Lord says to Hezekiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, uh, the Lord says to Isaiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, I'm going to give him 15 more years. 
You just told him. He's going, Lord, you just said he's going to die. I got to go back and tell him now he gets 15 more years. Yep. So what am I saying? When you, when you hear a prophetic word, the, the weight of the fulfillment of the, of the word is not on exclusively on the person who gave the word. Some of the responsibility falls on the hearers in terms of how that thing plays out. Did you understand what I just said? Sometimes people will hear a prophetic word and they'll say, for whatever reason, it didn't come to pass. Well, it could have been it wasn't the Lord. But it could have been that it was the Lord and the person didn't embrace the word properly in the eyes of God. Their heart wasn't right toward whatever it was that was being spoken. Yeah, yeah, but I'll wait back and see. The, the attitude, I'll just wait and see, is not, a, is not a Mary attitude. Mary's attitude was, this is too wonderful for me, but even so, let it be what you've said. Yeah. David's attitude toward the Lord, when um, uh, the, Nathan prophesied the Davidic covenant, David went in and sat before the Lord. He says, really, this is too good for me, but go ahead on, I'll take it. <laughs> So these things are, there's, there's, a, there's a component in us concerning the word of the Lord. All of this contains promises that are true to everybody in this room. But whether you experience them in the days of your walk with God or not depends on how you receive the word and respond to the word. Agreed? Now, this is 66 books of prophecy of various types. And so um, a lot of it is conditional to our response in terms of how it benefits us or not. Back to the text. So, verse 20, Elisha dies, and uh, they buried him. And bands of the Moabites invaded the land the coming year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, behold, they spied a, a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he, he revived and stood up on his feet. That was my point about it. he didn't die in sin because he was, a friend of mine preached a message one time, anointed to the bone. <laughs> Based on this text, I love that title, anointed to the bone. What, by the way, what they did was they would have two burials. They would inter the body until the flesh deteriorated off the bones, and then they would gather the bones into a small sarcophagus. So if you've ever seen these things in Israel, these small boxes of bones, they started out with a full body, and then they gathered the bones to whatever the length of your longest bone is, I guess your leg bone, the box was that size. They put your bones in a smaller box. So they'd have a second burial after roughly a year. And so Elisha apparently was pre that second burial when they threw this guy down in there and made contact with his bones. That's my guess about the second barrel. Okay, so um, uh, chapter 14, just moving quickly through chapter 14. Um, Amaziah was a good king of Judah. He did right. He wasn't as good as David, but he was a good guy. But in verse 13 and 14, Jehoash, king of Israel, took the king of Judah, who was a good guy, took him captive, came to Jerusalem, he broke down the wall of Jerusalem, part of the wall, it gives the, the dimension there, about 400 cubits, and he took all the gold and the silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord. That's the temple, plundered again. And so whether everything came back from Syria, I mean from uh, Samaria, and then this guy got it, don't know. Whether it ever came back from this, don't know. You understand? So this, this idea, the lost ark of the of the covenant and so forth. Who knows when the thing got gone? This place was plundered a number of different times. And uh, uh, so he, he dies. Jeroboam comes and he's reigning in his stead. There's an interesting prophecy about, this is the second Jeroboam, by the way. Jeroboam uh, reigns in the north in verse 23. He was king of the north 41 years. So this second Jeroboam gets confusing since there were two kings of the north named Jeroboam. But this guy... Uh, reestablished the borders of the northern kingdom. According to the word of Jonah, the prophet, verse 25, he restored the, the coast of Israel, the borders of Israel, from the entering in of Hamath to the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai. This is the same Jonah that wrote the book of Jonah. 
And so that word is not contained in the book of Jonah, but it's contained here, this prophetic word. Everybody see that one little verse? Verse 25 of chapter 14. That's a one-sentence prophecy by Jonah the prophet. So it wasn't only the, you know, in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. He did have some other prophetic goings-on, but this is, a, this is one that's not recorded anywhere else in the Scripture. Chapter 15, uh, Judah has a good king named um, uh, Azariah. He um, uh, does right in the sight of the Lord. They have a couple of bad kings in the north. Some more stuff happens, yada, yada, yada. Then verse 27, in the two and fiftieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, began to reign over Israel. He reigned 20 years. He did that which was evil in the, day, in his, um, in the sight of the Lord. Verse 29, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. Now this is the, as I said, Jonah prophesied to the northern kingdom. They repented temporarily. But then they continued their aggression. And so they're going to come against the, the northern kingdom here and begin to destroy. And so um, uh, they took, it says, the Galilee, they took Gilead, the Galilee, all the land of Naphtali. At the end of verse 29, it says, they carried them captive to Assyria. So the Assyrian destruction of 722 B.C. happens later. This is a, an early attack by Assyria. The Assyrian conquest happened in phases, not all at one time. So this is like the first time the Assyrians come, okay? You with me? And they take part of the northern kingdom. They take, they name them specifically. Uh, Hazer, Gilead, um, Galilee, the land of Naphtali, they carried them away to Assyria. So this early, early um, striking. This is somewhere between 780 and it's prior to 722. So somewhere, in, I'd guess 730, 750, somewhere in that uh, B.C. Verse 32, in the second year of Pekah, son of Remaliah, the king of, e of Israel began, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Verse 34, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. By the way, his mother's name was Jerusha, which is Bill's daughter's name as well. Is this where you got it? Yes. Good name. And uh, he dies. Jotham sleeps with his fathers in verse 38. Ahaz, his son, reigns. Chapter 16, Ahaz was a bad guy. Um, he didn't do what was right in the ways of the Lord. He was um, not a good guy. Verse 5, Rezin, the king of Syria. Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. They besieged it. Uh, they besieged Ahaz, but they couldn't overcome Jerusalem. But Ahaz went and made a, an alliance with Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, in verse 7. And so he, um, he paid him tribute. Verse 8, Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and sent them for a present to the king of Assyria. It's just like the temple was the bank to pay off the bad guys. You know, it's just over and over again. It makes you wonder, you know, what do they got there now? Like two brass spoons or something? What's he finding after all this time? Anyway, he uses it as a ransom, and uh, they're appeased temporarily, but this Ahaz dies, and um, uh, not a very good guy. But his son, Hezekiah, is a good guy. Hezekiah then comes to be king of, um, of Judah. Now, chapter 17. Chapter 17 is a pivotal chapter in Jewish history. Let's just pause for a second and, and look this way. Seminal events in Israel's history. There are, are three major, major um, events in Israel's history. More, but three big ones. The first one is the Exodus account coming out of Egypt, going to Sinai, the Sinai Covenant. I'm including all that in one event. So that, that was a major uh, point where Israel went from being a family to a nation. They went into a covenant with Almighty God. This, what's about to happen in chapter 17 is the Assyrian Empire is going to conquer the northern ten tribes, take them into captivity. That's 722 B.C. Here we are in 2018, and there is still no definitive answer as to what became of those ten tribes that were taken 2,700 years ago into captivity major event. 
The cause of the event is the sin of Jeroboam, as I'll show you in a few minutes, the golden calf worship. This is what ultimately brought their destruction. Idolatry also almost brought destruction of Judah with this same Assyrian conquest that takes place. But God is going to have mercy on Judah because of the prayers of Hezekiah and Isaiah. I'll show you from, again from the scriptures. And so Judah, although judgment was deserved for Judah, it was delayed from 722 B.C. to 586 B.C. That's the other big seminal event date. That's the Babylonian conquest of Judah, where Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is destroyed. And so those dates, and of course I'm not including New Testament dates. The, uh, the Exodus account, roughly 500 B.C. The uh, Syrian conquest, finally done, 722 B.C. As I said, it came in phases. The Babylonian conquest, the finality being 586 B.C., those are the big ones. So if you ever get a hold of a timeline of Old Testament history, and I've given you a bunch of them, those are, those are the big pivots. And so one of them occurs here in this chapter 17. The details are repeated in Chronicles and in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. It's so important it's repeated three different ways. But let's look at chapter 17. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah began to reign Hoshea, the son of Ella, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. He was evil. Verse 3, against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. So we have a different king now. Time has gone by. And Hoshea became his servant, a vassal. He gave him presents. He paid tribute. The king of Assyria uh, found conspiracy in Hoshea. Because he had sent messengers uh, to So, king of Egypt, and he bought, brought no t uh, tribute to Assyria, uh, as he had done in the past. And so the Assyrian army comes, in verse 5, king of Assyria came up through all the land. He went up to Samaria, besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria. This is the big one. Why? Verse 7. For it was so that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Other seminal event. Verse 8, And walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things which were not right against the Lord their God. Verse 10, They set them up images and groves. Verse 11, and there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen. Verse 12, For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according towards all the law I've given you. Verse 15, And they rejected his statutes, and his covenant that he had made with their fathers. Verse 16, they left all the commandments of the Lord their God, made them molten images, even two calves. So the, they're explicitly mentioned as being the issue. Verse 17, they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. Verse 18, therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah. And I might add Benjamin because they were merged by that point. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they'd made. Remember this, this um, uh, syncretism where Ahab's sons had married into Judah, the southern kingdom. And they had come and they had carried over that same worship of Ashtoreth and Baal down to the southern kingdom as well. And so they, they were worthy of judgment at this point in time too. My opinion is they were spared specifically because of righteous Hezekiah and Isaiah. You know, you can make a different case, but that's my opinion. The judgment was not canceled. It was delayed over 100 years, but it was delayed. I pray that for the United States, by the way, because I think we're, I think we're due some judgment. But I pray delay it. Delay it. Delay it. If he could delay it for them for 140-something years, he could delay it for us for a while. And so the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel, says in verse 20, and um, verse 21, For he tore Israel from the house of David, 
And they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them to sin a great sin. Verse 23, part B. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria to this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon. Now this was, the, and from Cush and all these other places, Kuthan from Ava. What they would do, the Assyrians would come and transplant you out of your homeland and scatter you among, among the nations and bring people from those other nations they conquered, put them in your land so there was no nationalistic fervor. You couldn't gather all your, your same language group, your same uh, kinsmen and so forth. You couldn't gather them together because they're all scattered in the countries. And so this is the Samaritan area that was a problem in Jesus' time, was a mixed group that was brought in from the nations. Jews did trickle back in, but they intermarried with that group brought in from the nations in Samaria, in the northern kingdom. And so at the time of Jesus, they were like half Jews. You know, they had a measure of Judaism. They had a, a measure of um, uh, the old covenant scriptures that they held to, but they also had this mixture of other religions brought in during this, this time frame. And so um, uh, they didn't fear the Lord, those that were brought in. And um, verse 27, the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry there one of the priests who you brought out of there. Let him go in and teach the people the manner of the God of the land. And so they brought a priest in and said, You, you need to watch out for Yahweh. He'll hurt you. You go here and mess up. <laughs> and so um, uh, let's just finish with that. Now, chapter 18. Yes, you may. Say, I didn't hear you. You got to speak up. Yeah. Well, our assumption is Jeremiah wrote Kings. So till the fall of the northern, till the fall of the southern kingdom, they were still there. Um, all right, so. I am now going to get to Hezekiah, and Brother Hezekiah is a good guy, although he had his moments too, but he definitely, by the Lord's judgment, was a good king. So by our judgment, he's a good king. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Ella, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Verse 3, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places, broke the images, cut down the groves, broke in pieces, I'm in verse 4, the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Excuse me, does everyone meet, remember the brazen serpent in the wilderness that Moses raised on the stick? when the people were being bitten by poisonous snakes and when they would look up to the, the brazen serpent, then Jesus referred to this brazen serpent in uh, the New Testament as being a symbol of him, sin being lifted up on the cross. And so they, they um, made an idol out of that thing that Moses had made. They were real quick to make idols. And something, when the Lord used some kind of symbol, they would make an idol. Oh, that's an idol. Let's, let's hang on to that. We'll burn incense to it. But he trusted in God. He did everything right um, in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 6, he clave to the Lord, departed not from following him, kept his commandments which the Lord commanded him. And the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, he prospered. In verse 9, it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, the king of Israel, that Salmaneser, the king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. At the end of the three years, he took it, in the sixth year of Hezekiah. And the king of Assyria decided he was going to go after Judah too. In verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. Jerusalem wasn't the only walled city in the southern kingdom. He took all of them except, Jer except Jerusalem in Judah. And so Hezekiah 
sent to the king of, of Assyria and said, you know, what have I done to upset you? And he tried to pay him off, sent him a bunch of silver and a bunch of gold. And verse 15, here we go again. Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. So Hezekiah did the same daggum thing with this, these temple treasures. And at that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And so they, the Lord was paying the, paying the ransom. And the king of the king of Assyria was satisfied for a while. And then uh, he sent this guy, Reb Shaka, against um, Jerusalem. He wanted more and more and more. And, and um, so he came up against this Reb Shaka. He claimed that Yahweh had sent him. He said specifically, verse 25, I'm still in chapter 18. This is Reb Shaka speaking. Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. That's pretty brazen, isn't it? He's claiming to speak in the, in the name of, in the word there is Yahweh, in the name of the Lord. And so verse 28, Reb Shaka stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews language outside of the gates of Jerusalem. Hear the word of the great king of Assyria. Thus says the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hands of the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah, for listen to the king of Assyria. Verse 33, Have any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Let me just pause right there for a second. And so we know from history, extra-biblical history, the, the Assyrians, when they would come, if the people would willingly submit themselves, they would subjugate them and transplant them. If they had to be conquered, they would decapitate everybody. This business that's going on with Islam, with the decapitation, didn't start with Islam. And so the Assyrians would make mountains of the heads they cut off as a, as a testimony to anyone who would resist. They would also skin residents alive. That was another of their signature atrocities, if you will. So the beheading and the skinning alive, they, they did that on a grand scale over the known world in their generation. They were especially bloody in their conquests. And so literally it's recorded there were mountains of heads with some of these cities they conquered. This is what Jerusalem was facing with the leaders being skinned alive and the regular people being beheaded. They resisted. And so this guy's reminding him, has anybody else ever gotten away with this? Have anybody else's gods ever defended them from us? Verse 34, where are the gods of Hamath and of Arphad? Where are the gods of Shepharim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? In other words, the Lord's just another of the gods. He can't do anything to help you. And so chapter 19, it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself in sackcloth, and he went into the house of the Lord to pray. And he sent somebody for Isaiah the prophet. In verse 6, Isaiah said to them, to the um, uh, messengers, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, be not afraid of the words which you have heard, which the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I'll cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And so the Lord is, is taking, the, taking the throne, or taking up the, uh, the cause. Verse 14 this is a, an interesting paradigm, and I would suggest that all of you adopt this as a prayer practice. This verse 14, notice. Hezekiah received the letter at the hands of the messengers, read it. Hezekiah, this is the messengers from Assyria. He went up to the house of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord God with this letter. Now, let's just say you get bad news of whatever kind. Let's say you get a, a horrific email, letter, note. Let's say that you're facing 
uh, whatever, tax liens, bankruptcies, whatever kind of whatever kind of paper document is is assaulting your life or declaring an assault on your life, your health, whatever it is, this practice of spreading it before the Lord and praying over it is a biblical practice. Do you understand what I'm saying? I just got in the mail this medical report. You know, dear Mr. Evans, we've determined you have cancer. You've got 90 days to live. Lord, this is what they say. What do you say? This is what Hezekiah is going to do. Lord, you see what they say. What do you say? I'm appealing to you. I know what they say, but Lord, I'm listening for what you're going to say. Lord, can you do something about this? You see the, the principle. And so Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. Verse 15, he said, O Lord God of Israel, who dwells between the cherubim, Thou art God, even Thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down Thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, Thine eyes and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Verse 19. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech Thee, save Thou us out of His hand, that all of the kingdoms of the earth may know that Thou art the Lord God, even Thou only. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, I heard you. I'm going to take care of this. It's interesting that he didn't speak directly to Hezekiah, but he spoke to Isaiah and said, Go tell him. Verse 21, This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you and laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at you. Who have you reproached and blasphemed? And against whom have you exalted your voice and lifted up your eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Verse 32, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come against it with a shield, nor lay a siege bank against it. By the way that he came, he shall return, and shall not come into this city. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. In verse 35, the answer came in the form of an angelic visitation. It came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out, smote the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000 men. One night, they were all dead. By the way, if one real angel from heaven manifested fully on this planet to mankind, Everybody on the planet would flee from their presence. They are, they are created beings, but they are awesome supernatural beings. Whether this one had more power compared to other angels or not, I don't know. Was he just an ordinary angel or an extraordinary angel? I don't know. But one angel to kill 185,000 guys in one night, that's nobody to trifle with. Agreed? So Sennacherib left and went back to Nineveh. And uh, his sons, it says in verse 37, his sons killed him there with the sword. That was years later, by the way, but it did come to pass. Chapter 20, in those days was Hezekiah sick to death. This is another conditional prophecy. We talked about it briefly. The prophet Isaiah went in and says, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you're going to die and not live. Did you see any wiggle room in that? Does anybody see any wiggle room in that? Uh, maybe, maybe things might not go well for you. You know, you, you're going to have a cold or whatever. It's definitive. You're a dead man. So he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, I d I've done the best I could. <laughs> and he cried. And it came to pass after Isaiah was gone out in the middle of court, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, turn around and tell Hezekiah, I heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll heal you on the third day. Now note that. I'm going to heal you. That's no condition with that either, right? I'm going to heal you. And you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add to your days 15 years. And then verse 7, Isaiah gives a condition for the healing. I didn't hear any condition before. Verse 7, Isaiah says, take a lump of figs. They took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, I'm not a nurse, but she's a nurse. That's a poultice. Yeah, the fig compound on a boil was a poultice. The Lord used that to bring Hezekiah's healing. If Hezekiah had said, no, no, I don't want that fig thing on me, what do you think would have happened? 
<laughs> I'm serious. The Lord didn't say, I'm going to heal you with a bunch of figs. Isaiah came with the figs after the fact. He said, put this on him. The poultice was a form of a medicinal um, remedy for the boil that probably had blood poisoning going on. Why did the Lord do that? I have no clue. Why did the Lord give him the 15 years when he said he's going to die? It appears that the, the, the heart of Hezekiah was right. Now, I've heard people try to take this and say Hezekiah sinned by asking for the 15 years. He was out of the will of the Lord. And the reason they say that is he's going to give birth or his, his wife is going to give birth to Manasseh, who is the wickedest king Israel ever had. But the problem with that logic is Manasseh is going to give birth to Josiah, who is the best king Israel ever had. So Josiah nor Manasseh would have been born if Hezekiah had died. You, you, so that, that argument to me holds no water. Say again. That's right. I don't think there's any kind of sin issue. I think God was pleased with his, his prayer. You know, I think he did just what he said. He had mercy. He asked for mercy. He got mercy. And so, um, uh, what's the takeaway on that? You know, sickness comes on all men sooner or later. But I don't think we have to just kind of roll over and die. It's not necessarily the will of the Lord that you just go ahead and die. I think it's always right. The, the New Testament says the last enemy to be overcome is death. That indicates death is not our friend. I understand people say it's part of life. Nobody gets out of here alive. I understand all that. But we're not to embrace death as just, a, oh, it's just a natural thing. It's an enemy to be overcome is what the New Testament says, right? So you, you contend against enemies. You don't yield willingly to enemies. I, I, I recognize <laughs> that the odds of victory are slim to, to none. In an ultimate sense, only a few people like Elijah have, have walked around the death angel. Isn't that conditional also? I don't know. I, you know, whether, whether there will be a people in the earth that are able to overcome death as an enemy before Jesus returns, I don't know. But I know this, it's not our friend. It's not our friend, you know, according to the Word of God. I, you know, I'll take that one step further. We were not created by heaven with the intent that we would be finite beings. Okay. And so there's something in the heart of man that knows we're not supposed to die. There's something in each of us that knows that was not the original intent of heaven for us. And ultimately, we will step over death, but we may have to go through this death to get there. Okay. So Isaiah takes the lump of figs and tells him to put him on him, and so he recovers. And, uh, uh, but before he recovers, Hezekiah says, all this sounds good, but give me a sign so I believe that I'm really going to recover and get these 15 years. And so uh, Isaiah says, well, what sign would you like? You know, what do you, what do you want me to do? Isaiah said, this sign shall you have of the Lord that the Lord will do this thing. I'm in verse 9 of chapter 20. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degree, degrees or go back 10 degrees? Now, the Joshua miracle of the earth standing still, the sun standing still, was one of the greatest miracles in the Bible because it would have required the sun to stop, the earth to stop revolving around the sun and for the earth to stop turning on its axis for that to happen. This is going to cause the earth to have to reverse its axis. For the sun to go back, the shadow to go back 10 degrees, the earth not only has to stop, it has to reverse on its axis. Now, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a, a natural scientist, but if that were to happen, they tell us that it would pretty well destroy things on this planet. If the earth, this is like supernatural on a cosmic scale. <laughs> and so Hezekiah says, it's a small thing for the shadow to go forward 10 degrees. Let the shadow go backwards 10 degrees. Verse 11, Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards by which it had gone down in the sundial of Ahaz. And so the earth reversed 10 degrees. Um, 
I don't even know what to say about that one. In the Old Testament, that's one of the two greatest miracles in the Old Testament. You know, and I think it's incontrovertible. You, would you agree? It's amazing. Hezekiah dies, verse 21, chapter 21, Manasseh. His son is 12 years old. He began to reign. He reigned 55 years, and he was a wicked guy. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, he built up all the places of idolatry that Ahab had originally had. He worshipped all the, the gods of Ahab, built altars in the house of the Lord in the temple. He built altars for the host of heaven in the temple of God. He made his son pass through the fire. He used enchantments. He dealt with familiar spirits. He did about everything on the menu he could do. And um, uh, uh, verse 10, the Lord spoke by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations and has done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, has made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both of his ears shall tingle. Uh, verse 14, I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance, deliver them into the hands of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil for all their enemies. Uh, verse 16, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin, to do which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now verse 17 says, Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did in his sin are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah. Now I want to pause there a second. We'll go through this when we get into chronicles. But Second Chronicles chapter 33 says that he repented. He ended up going into captivity, and while in captivity, he repented. And there is a book, an apocryphal book, called The Prayer of Manasseh, that was probably not actually penned by Manasseh, but it's a very beautiful prayer of repentance. So here's what I'm telling you. Chronicles tells us he repented and prayed. There is a very old book of the apocrypha that's called The Prayer of Manasseh. It was actually included in the in the um, canon of the 1611 King James Bible. If you've got a real 1611 version King James, it's got it in the Apocrypha. The Catholic Bible has it as well. And so I printed the prayer of Manasseh on your notes. You can look at it on the bottom. It's such a beautiful prayer of repentance. Um, I want to read it. If this was not his prayer, he prayed something like this, because Chronicles tells us he was forgiven for his sins. O Lord God Almighty, of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of their righteous seed, who has made heaven and earth with all the ornament thereof, who has bound the sea by the word of thy commandment, who has shut up the deep and sealed it by thy terrible and glorious name, whom all men fear and tremble before thy power. For the majesty of thy glory cannot be borne, and thine angry threatening toward sinners is importable. But thy, mercies, thy merciful promise is unmeasurable and unsearchable. For thou art the, the Most High Lord of great compassion, long-suffering, very merciful, and repentest of the evil of men. Thou, O Lord, according to thy great goodness, hast promised repentance and forgiveness to them that have sinned against thee. And of thine infinite mercies have thou appointed repentance unto sinners, that they may be saved. Thou, therefore, O Lord that art the God of the just, hath not appointed repentance to the just, as to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, which have not sinned against thee. But thou hast appointed repentance unto me, that am a sinner. For I have sinned above the number of the sands of the sea. My transgressions, O Lord, are multiplied. My transgressions are multiplied, and I am not worthy to behold and see the height of heaven for the multitude of mine iniquities. I am bowed down with many iron bands, and I cannot lift up my head, neither have any release, for I have provoked thy wrath and done evil before thee. I did not thy will, neither kept I thy commandments. I have set up abominations and have multiplied offenses. Now, therefore, I bow the knee of my heart. I love that expression. I bow the knee of my heart. Isn't that beautiful? Beseeching thee of grace. I have sinned, O Lord. I have sinned, and I acknowledge my iniquities. Wherefore, I humbly beseech thee, forgive me, O Lord, forgive me, and destroy me not with my iniquities. Be not angry with me forever, 
by reserving evil for me, neither condemn me to the lower parts of the earth. For thou art God, even the God of them that repent. And in me thou wilt show all thy goodness. For thou wilt save me, that I am unworthy according to thy great mercy. Therefore, I will praise thee forever all the days of my life. For all the powers of heaven do praise thee. And thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's a beautiful prayer of repentance. Um, as I said, probably not actually pinned by him, but maybe similar to the things that he actually prayed from the results that we know from the scriptures. You got this cough thing that's going around? Mary and Rachel got it. Okay. Chapter um, uh, 22. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Verse 2, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So this is a very good guy. Verse 8, and Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. Now let's just pause for a second. Chronicles expands on this too. This may have been the only existent copy of the word of the Lord. Remember Manasseh was a very wicked guy that preceded Josiah. He tried to eradicate the worship of Yahweh out of Israel. He took all the stuff in the temple. He set up groves and idols in the temple, remember? Places of false worship and so forth. Well, this book of the Lord was hidden in the temple. And it's going to contain some things that Josiah and the other Jews are completely unaware of because it's been missing from them. And so, um, um, verse 10, Shaphan the scribe showed it to the king, saying, Helkiah found this book. Verse 11, it came to pass when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. He said, we're in trouble, boys. If what's in this book is true, we are in big trouble. Verse 13, go ye and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened to the words of this book to do according to all which is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and all these others went to Hulda the prophetess in verse 14. Hulda is one of several prophetesses that are mentioned in the Old Testament. Um, the wife of, I mean, the sister of, of uh, Moses, Miriam, was a prophetess. Deborah, the judge of Israel, is called a prophetess. This Hulda is called a prophetess. And the wife of Isaiah is also a prophetess. So we have multiple uh, prophetesses identified as such. And good, good people, not bad people in the Old Testament. Um, take it to her. In verse 15, she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Verse 18, But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, As touching the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you have humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and have rent your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered into your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil that I'm going to bring on this place. There's judgment's coming, but once again, it's, it's delayed, Josiah, because your heart is right toward me. Yeah, there's judgment coming. It's got to happen, but I can hold it off till your life is over. And so in, the, in this promise, um, and so chapter 23, the, Josiah is expanded on significantly in Chronicles. We'll talk about him more. But in chapter 23, the king sent, they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. 
in verse 2, part B, he read the, the book in their, the book of the covenant to all of them. Verse 3, the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. Everybody see that verse? This is that Jacob's pillow again, according to those that believe in such. So this pillar of the kings of Israel is mentioned here again. It's a place of authority. They would go to this thing for, for um, in times of, of declaring their authority as king. He made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant or all the people um, took their stand for the, govern, for the covenant, we would say. And so he put down the idolatrous priest, he cleaned up the temple. Verse 6, he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord, um, Jerusalem. He stamped it into small powder. Verse 7, he broke down the house of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord. These are temple prostitutes, male temple prostitutes. Verse 10, he defiled Topek, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom that no man might make his sons pass through the fire to Molech. The Hinnom Valley is one of the two major valleys in Jerusalem. Uh, verse 15, moreover, the altar that was at Bethel. Now, this altar was prophesied about. Remember the prophetic word that was given about the altar at Bethel back when Jeroboam was the king? This is in, I'm not going to turn to it right now, but it's in 1 Kings chapter 12. A prophet came to the altar in Bethel and prophesied to King Jeroboam that there was going to be a man that was going to rise up named Josiah that was going to destroy that altar and was going to burn the bones of the priests on that altar. You remember that prophetic word? And then the king was mad at him, tried to grab him. The king became leprous and the prophet prayed for him. The leprosy went away, but Jeroboam, the prophet was real. This is one of the two named prophecies in scripture. Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus would come and caused the rebuilding of the temple, the Persian king Cyrus. And that, that prophet in uh, 1 Kings prophesied Josiah. And here it comes. Verse 15, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place he broke down. And he burned the high place and stamped it to powder and burned the grove. Verse 16, And Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were in the mountain, the graves. And he sent, he took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God had, had proclaimed to proclaim these words. So in, not only did he name the guy by name, he prophesied what he was going to do. I think we're roughly 150 years later. You know, that's pretty good prophesying. <laughs> you know? We can't get it right from one week to the next. These guys are prophesying hundreds of years in advance by name. It's pretty sporty. Verse um, 19, And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the king, kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. He slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars, and burned the men's bones upon them, and returned to Jerusalem. The king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover of the Lord your God, as written in the book of this covenant. By the way, over and over again in the Old Covenant Scriptures, when there were times of renewal, there was Passover celebrated again. Passover would fall into disuse, and then when there would be times of reawakening and renewal, they would celebrate the Passover publicly. And um, verse 22, surely there was not held such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah, that nothing to compare with what Josiah did. Now he included in that verse, David and Solomon. Not even David and Solomon held a Passover like this guy. Verse 23, but in the 18th year, King Josiah of King Josiah wherein this Passover was held to the Lord in Jerusalem. Uh, moreover, workers with familiar spirits and so forth, he did away with them. Verse 25, And like him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might. Isn't that what the scripture says? Love the Lord your God with all. 
according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him arose any none like him. Notwithstanding, um, the Lord um, took him. In his days, in verse 29, Pharaoh Necho, the king of Egypt, went up against Assyria. And uh, the king Josiah decided he was going to go out and fight Pharaoh Necho. Necho tried to talk him out of it, and he died. And um, I think it was an unnecessary death. I think I'll go into that in Chronicles. In chapter 24, um, we've got a new king. We've got um, uh, uh, Eliakim, the son of Josiah as the king. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up. And Jehoiakim became his servant, his vassal. And so this is the Babylonian captivity. It started approximately 606 B.C. It's going to go off and on for 20 years. This, this first visit by Babylon, some Jews were taken into Babylon. Maybe Daniel was taken. Maybe Ezekiel was taken. We don't know who was taken, but some were taken in this first go-round. Verse 3, Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that was shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Jehoiakim dies in verse 6, and Jehoiakim dies, and his son Jehoiakim begins to reign, hence these easy names. Jehoiakim was 18 when he began to reign. He was evil. Verse 10, At that time the service of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem again. Jerusalem's besieged. This is the second go-round, believed to be about 597 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, servants came. They took the city. Jehoiakim went out um, with the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon um, carried out there the treasures in verse 13. He carried out all the treasures of the house of the Lord, cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, the king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said, carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, carried away all, um, verse 15, carried away Jehoiakim, the king, to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, the officers, the mighty of the land, so there's a bunch of people got hauled off to Babylon with this go around, And uh, put up another vassal king, named him Zedekiah, changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah reigned a little while, then he rebelled, and here comes Nebuchadnezzar for the big one back in chapter 25. So chapter 25 is another one of these seminal chapters. Chapter 17 is the Assyrian conquest. Chapter 25 is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, Zedekiah's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he and all of his hosts came against Jerusalem. And they besieged Jerusalem. Uh, there was a famine in the city. They took it ultimately, verse 4, the city was broken up. All the men of war fled by night, but they didn't get away from the king. And uh, the king um, judged, judged them. Verse 7, they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. They put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with chains, carried him to Babylon. Verse 9, Nebuchadnezzar burnt the house of the Lord. He destroyed Solomon's temple. On the ninth of Av, by the way, this is this day you hear about the Jews in mourning. They know the date this occurred. The king's house, they burnt all the houses of Jerusalem. And every great man's house, he burnt with fire. All the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. In verse 13, the pillars of brass that were in the house of the Lord. Remember the two, uh, Boaz and Joachim, the two pillars. They were in the house of the Lord, the bases and the, um, the bronze sea that was in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans, which is Babylonians, broke in pieces and carried the brass back to Babylon. Verse 15, the fire pans and the bowls and such things were of gold. The silver, uh, the captain of the guard took away and... Um, uh, they just carried away everything. Verse 26, And all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the armies arose, came to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldees. They escaped down there. We'll go through this in Jeremiah and in um, this account. We'll go through this in Jeremiah and we'll go through it in uh, Chronicles. Now I want to pause there a second. This chapter 25 
of 2 Kings. Tonight, when you go home or tomorrow, I want you to read the whole chapter carefully. While chapter 25 is occurring, three of the greatest prophets of the Bible are writing. Jeremiah is in the city of Jerusalem while all this is going on. Jeremiah is writing about events that are unfolding from inside of Jerusalem. Daniel is in the court of Nebuchadnezzar writing. And Ezekiel is among the outcast by the river um, in Babylon among the refugees writing. So three, the, three of the four major prophets are writing about this event from different perspectives. They're all seeing it from different views. So this, you, you heard me say before, this is one of the most important things in the Bible for Israel's history. So the timing of Jeremiah... Ezekiel and Daniel overlaps this. The stories are repeated in various ways in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The only other major prophet, by the way, is Isaiah. And Isaiah was with Hezekiah when they turned back the Assyrians. So this, this event is, is tremendously important. It's repeated again in detail in Second Chronicles. And it's repeated in those prophets, particularly in Jeremiah. Jeremiah's account is graphic for what takes place because he's in the city watching it in real time. The others are already gone. So when you read this chapter 25, it's a, it's a baseline of understanding for what's going to come next in Chronicles, then as we get into the prophets. So just to continue this, um, verse 27, it came to pass in the 7th and 13th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, that evil Meroadak, the king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up, lift up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, out of prison. And so he um, spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the other kings that were there with him in Babylon and treated him decent, but he was still a captive. And so next week we'll get into the book of Chronicles, into the, to First Chronicles. I would read um, first 15 chapters of Chronicles. First 10 chapters are a lot of genealogies, but the prayer of Jabez is in there and some other cool stuff. The, um, the families of David and Saul, of Saul are in there. And then chapter 10 is the death of Saul. I'd go through about chapter 15 in first Chronicles to be safe, okay? Questions about what we did tonight? I know it went fast, but like I said, a lot of the material is going to be repeated. And uh, some of these, as I said, no-name no kings didn't amount to much, so we just didn't go into all those guys. I think it's interesting that Ahab and his wicked wife affected three generations. If you count Ahab and Jezebel, four generations. If you count Omri, Ahab's father, five generations of wickedness in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were perpetuated by one little family. You know, conversely, a family like David's family brought good, you know. It's, it's amazing what one wicked dynasty can do, you know. And so uh, it's also amazing to me that if Manasseh was the worst they ever had and he repented, nobody's beyond the reach of God. You know, I hear people sometimes talk about this person or that person saying there's no hope. Let me tell you something, friends. Anybody that's still breathing is a candidate for the redemptive power of God. When it's over, they stop breathing. And so don't ever quit praying for anybody, whether it's a politician or a family member or whomever, because nobody's out of the reach of the Lord's mercy and forgiveness if they'll just turn. You know, it's never too late until that last breath. So we need to always believe for the Lord's highest and best. So, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, um, uh, for righteous King Josiah. Lord, we thank you for uh, Hezekiah and the other great men of God that you used. We thank you for Hulda the prophetess and other righteous women of God. We thank you, Lord, that um, there's so many details that are hard to grasp, Lord, but you give us the grace to receive a bit every time we look. Lord, there's something new every time we look. And so as we get into Chronicles, Lord, or just pray for greater revelation, fresh revelation, fresh insight into your ways, into your word, and into your, your nature, so that we might know you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.